Father, our eyes, our hearts are lifted towards you this morning, and, and Father, we see you, God, we see you as Savior, Lord, that you have saved us with an awesome salvation, saving us from sin and from death and from pain and from sorrow, and Lord, this morning as we stand in your presence, as we worship God, we just want to say thank you again, and Father, we pray that as we 
go through the remainder of this service, Lord, that you would just pour out your spirit and minister to our hearts, we pray. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord. Awesome worship. Thank you, worship team. So uh, blessed to just be able to sing the songs uh, that bring glory to God and through which we express our hearts, through which we express the worship that only God is due. Amen. What a blessing that song is, that God has created music for us. And a, many, music is used in many ways, but I'm so thankful that God owns music and that it's his design and his creation and that he's given it to us as a gift that we might worship him. And uh, what, a, what a privilege it is to worship with you this morning. And it's a privilege to share and, and of course, want to just draw your attention to uh, Pastor Glenn and Barb as they uh, go through this difficulty and and Barb was telling me that this is Glenn's third surgery since they've moved. So uh, I told her the Lord was just storing him up because he he, knew he was working here, right? But uh, she wanted uh, us to know that, that she has really sensed God in this whole process. And even though it's been a difficult trial um, starting just yesterday, that, that God, she has sensed that God has just been with them and has blessed Glenn with the help and the and the and the uh, attention that he needs. So we just want to give God praise for that. Also want to just bring uh, the Bellinger family to you to your attention again. Just be praying for them, Dana and Raymond, the siblings and and uh, the nieces and the nephews, and and just uh, pray for their family that God would comfort them and speak into them during this just incredibly difficult time. And also remember uh, Sandy. Sherman, I'm sorry, uh, Sandy, yes, Sandy Sherman, who lost her mom um, this last week. So just remember that family, too. Amen. Baptism. Kind of an important topic, wouldn't you say? Baptism. What is it? Why do we do it? What's it all about? It's interesting in, in the Great Commission that Jesus did what? Jesus commanded his church to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that if you ever wondered how important it is, you don't really need to wonder that much, do you? It's right there in the beginning. Jesus commanded his church, his people, to go and make disciples. And part of that process, I want you to baptize them. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is the command of Christ. There's... There's an incredible promise associated with baptism. Do you know what it is? Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Hallelujah. What an incredible promise that the Lord made all those who would believe and would be baptized. Incredible. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Hallelujah. God is good. And he calls his church to make disciples and to baptize. It's interesting. We, we think of the birth of the New Testament church at the day of Pentecost, don't we? When Jesus being exalted, ascending to the right hand of the Father, he poured out the Holy Spirit, right? On that day of Pentecost, and it was there in the first sermon, in the first message that Peter preached that he commanded all of those that could hear the message of the good news of Jesus Christ to be what? 
to be baptized, to be baptized. That was front and center of the message, is to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't a side thing, wasn't something that was brought up later, but it was brought up there at the birth of the church, the New Testament church, that men and women and all those who call upon the name of the Lord should be baptized. Acts 2.38, it'll be in front of you. Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It was part of the message, and just to give a little bit of background, we know that this was the group of people who, they were the ones that were chanting 50 days earlier, right? Approximately, crucify him, crucify him. This was the group of people that Peter referred to them, and he said, you killed Jesus. Peter didn't pull any punches, did he? He just said it like it was. You killed him. Yeah, you made Pilate do the dirty work. You made Rome do the dirty work, but you were behind it. You killed him. And Peter preached, and he said, I tell you that God has raised him up. God has raised him from the dead. And he has ascended on high, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. He is Lord, and he is Christ. That was the message. Be saved, Peter preached, from this crooked, some of your versions will say from this perverse generation, which is, seems to be more and more appropriate. But be baptized. Be baptized. There wasn't any ambiguity to it. There wasn't a lack of clarity to it. It was a command of the Lord Jesus Christ to all who would follow him that you are to make disciples and you are to baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that it was Saul who later was called Paul. That after he received his sight, remember he was blinded for three days, and after he received his sight, this was his first act. This was his Christian act, his first Christian act of devotion. He went and he was baptized. And so we're, we're building the case and we're seeing that this is just what the church did and it is what the church does. It is what those who want to follow Christ do. The, the book of Acts, of course, is filled with those who were baptized from Samaria, Samaria Cornelius, remember the story, Ethiopian eunuch, Lydia. Baptize, uh, baptism marked the early church. Now, this is something that has confused uh, denominations and churches and people, and it really doesn't have to be confusing. But what is the nature of baptism? What are we talking about? And if we look at the scriptures, we realize that it's really pretty clear. It's not sprinkling, right? It's not pouring some water on someone, but it's going down to the river and being immersed, or the body of water, the pool. It is being immersed. It is being dipped in the water. This is clear from the scripture. And I wonder sometimes, I'm not a historian, but I wonder sometimes how the practice of sprinkling got started because it's not in the word of God. The word of God is clear that the word baptism means to be immersed and to be dipped into the water. Now, just here are some scriptures that address this issue. They won't be in front of you, but, but just hear the context and hear what was going on. In the context of John the Baptist's ministry, it says that people were baptized in the Jordan River. It says of the ministry of John the Baptist that he ministered in a particular area and it gives the reason why he ministered there because there was a lot of water. When Jesus was baptized, it says of Jesus that he came up out of the water. The point is, again, that Christian baptism is not merely sprinkling, but it is to be immersed, it is to be dipped it is to go into the water. Not to bore you with the Greek, but it's interesting. One person noted that there are Greek words for sprinkling and there are Greek words for pouring. And had God wanted to authorize any of those, those words were available to the New Testament writers. But instead, he chose a word that never means sprinkling or pouring. 
So what does baptism mean? There's so much richness in baptism, in, in the meaning behind it, in the symbolism behind it. First off, realize this, that, that baptism is a very public thing. It is a statement to the world. The New Testament church did not baptize in secret, right? But openly, they baptized in the rivers and in pools. There's something that I think we need to realize that New Testament converts, people that had changed their thinking towards and about Jesus Christ, they wanted the world to know that I'm with him, Jesus of Nazareth. And so baptism was a very public statement to the world. I'm with Jesus. It's inter interesting that when we look at the ministry of John the Baptist, that there was a tremendous openness to what was happening, to what was going on. Look at this next verse, Matthew 3. It says, they went out to John and they were baptized by him in the Jordan. They were confessing their sins. This isn't something that was uh, secret or hidden, but this was something that was open, that there was transparency there. There was, I mean, if you get the picture, if you read it, you realize that, that they were acknowledging that they were sinners, right? There's no hiding there. That, that was openness. That was transparency. And in this particular case, it was a very clear public acknowledgement that, you know what, I'm a sinner and I need something different. I need to be forgiven of my sins. And the point is, is that the disciples of Jesus Christ, when they were baptized, they wanted to make a clear declaration, I believe in Jesus. And so there's an unmistakable connection between baptism and declaration that we are with him, Jesus. I believe in his message and I've, I've, as you know, I've been thinking a lot about the I am's of John. I believe that Jesus is the bread of life. I believe that he is the, the true vine. I believe that he is the door to the sheep. I believe that he is the light of the world. I believe that he is the good shepherd. I believe that he is the resurrection and the life. I believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that he is the great I am. I believe that, and so I'm baptized, and I'm identifying with Jesus. I believe in the work that he said he would do and did. Even as Jesus talked about giving his life, the good shepherd gives his life. Jesus talked about shortly before his, his crucifixion that he was going to give his blood, the blood of the new covenant that was shed for the remission of sins. Baptism is saying, I believe in this Jesus. I believe in who he said he was. I believe in the work that he said he would accomplish. And I believe in his resurrection, even as Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. Baptism says, I believe in that, that God has raised him from the dead. I believe that in him is life, right? Jesus said, I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Again, public baptism meant that I'm with God him. I'm with Jesus. I need this Jesus. I need a Savior, and he's the only one that God has given. I need the good shepherd. I need the power of his resurrection in my life. I need redemption. And so again, let me say to just begin, what does baptism mean? Baptism is a public statement of your belief in, your identification with, and your acceptance of Christ death, and burial, and resurrection. Baptism, of course, is, is rich in symbolism of our spiritual cleansing, right? If you think about it, as you are washed in the water, so are you are washed from your sins, amen? That's what baptism is about. It's a symbol, it's, it's a symbol of, of being washed spiritually. Look at this verse in Acts 22. This isn't something that... that uh, Christians have just come up with on their own. This is something that's rooted in the word of God and the revelation of God. And as Ananias told Paul, he says, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so baptism is associated with this 
this spiritual cleansing that goes on when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and His work and trust in Him for our souls, for our salvation. Baptism symbolizes that moment when the weight of our sin is taken from us. That's why it is a joyous occasion, because it's symbolic of that moment when we first believed, when we looked to Christ, and we gazed upon his glory, and we put our trust in his work of redemption and his salvation. It's such a joyous occasion when we, when we feel in our souls and our spirits that as far as the east is from the west, so far has our Lord separated our sins from us. That's a joyous time, isn't it? Baptism is a time of rejoicing and praising and worshiping God. Baptism is also symbolic in its representation of the death of our old man, right? That old man, that carnal man that the Lord is in the process of, of just getting rid of completely in our lives that's, that, that often raises its head, right? Baptism is a symbol, it's, a, it's symbolic of the death of the old man and the what? The resurrection of the new man, right? The old man goes down into the grave, the new man rises up to walk in newness of life. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Amen. That God desires us as we enter into baptism, that when we come out of that water that we see ourselves as new creations in Him. If any man is in Christ, he is a... New creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Lord wants us, when we think about baptism, to think about the death of our selfish man, the death that serves sin, the death that serves our lust, and to see us as resurrected to life in him. Look at this mass, uh, passage in Romans 6, 3. This says it so well. Do you not know that as, as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. And so the Lord links this coming up out of the water with our new life. We're saying no to the old man, and we're saying yes to the new man. We're saying yes, sin put Jesus Christ on the cross, but praise God, Jesus overcame sin when he rose from the dead. You go down into the watery grave, but you rise up in newness of life. You die with Christ that you might live with him. You went down living for yourself. You rise up living for him. You went down with a death sentence. You rise up with the gift of life. But the richness of baptism isn't limited to just a public statement of identification and belief in Christ. It's not just about that. It's not just limited to symbolism of our washing of our sins away, of the forgiveness that we experience in the new man, the death of the old man, and the, in the resurrection, the new life of the new man. But it is also a picture of the work that Christ does in us as we become part of his family. I love this passage in Matthew 3, 11. It'll be in front of you. It says, I indeed baptize you with water, John the Baptist speaking unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let me say it like this, that water baptism is symbolic of the true baptism not made with hands. Water baptism is symbolic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus does for every believer. As the waters, think about it, as the waters rush over us and covers us, so God pours out his spirit upon us, right? And in us. Look at this verse in Corinthians 12, 13 that tells us that it is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that, that we become part of the family of God. 
For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Again, capture that. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. You know, there's other verses that say if a man or a person doesn't have the spirit of God, he's none of Christ, right? The spirit is the spirit of identification. It's our guarantee of life. It's our connection with the unseen God. It is that power of God and the person of God that takes us from the kingdom of darkness to another kingdom, to the kingdom of God. It takes us from one reality to another reality. It bursts us again, right, as children of God. I love this verse in Titus 3, 5. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, this water baptism is symbolic of the baptism that Jesus does in filling us with his spirit. And through that filling, we become his, right? We become part of the family of God. We become connected with God. Wonderful, wonderful picture of the true baptism not made with hands. And it is also, of course, when we think of the baptism of the spirit that Jesus does, We also must think of the power that God gives us, right? Right? There's many scriptures that talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you trying to live your Christian life in your own strength? Or are you looking to something or someone outside of yourself, right? That's what the Holy Spirit is about. Even as Christ, even as the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead, so the Holy Spirit will give life to us, right? It will quicken our mortal bodies. And then the next verse says... Therefore, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. And so the Spirit of God is, is poured out. Is bapt- we're baptized in the Spirit by Jesus Christ, symbolized by water baptism, that puts us into the family of God and fills us with power to walk the Christian life and also to evangelize. Remember, that was the first command, right? Tarry in Jerusalem and tell. I've given you this great commission, Matthew 28. Remember the great commission that Jesus Christ gave the church But he said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until when? Until you are filled with the Holy Spirit with power. And so the Holy Spirit is given to us, and we become God's child, and we are filled with power to do kingdom work. And so today, I want to challenge you to just understand this about baptism, that it is necessary It is our Lord's command. It's not an option as if, you know, we were looking for a car and we wanted this option or that option. This isn't an option. God is saying to his people, be baptized. I want to encourage you to think of baptism as a bold declaration that that you are with him, right? That you are with Jesus Christ. I want to go and make that privilege. That, that I want to take the opportunity to have that privilege to step into the water and be immersed so that I can say publicly, I'm with Jesus. I want to encourage you again in Mark 16, 16 that says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. What a, what a promise that, that we can hardly get our minds around, right? It is not something to be entered into um, with a weight on your shoulder that I I need to do this, but it's rather to be entered into gladly, right? I love this, this verse in Acts 2. It says, those who gladly received his word were baptized. There is an element of gladness that should never be overlooked and that we should think about often when we think about being baptized. And so today, this ordinance that God gave the church. Just consider it a declaration that we are with him. That it is symbolic of our spiritual cleansing, the forgiveness of sins. That it is a beautiful picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of the new man. The the death and the burial of the old man and the resurrection of the new man. And remember that it is symbolic of the true baptism that is not made with hands, that is made by the Lord Jesus Christ when he fills you with his spirit and 
places you in his family for all eternity. Where you become reconciled and in community and in commune again with a holy God who loves you. Remember that connection. And remember that it is through the spirit, the baptism of the spirit, that we are empowered to walk in newness of life. To live as witnesses. These are the things that Christian baptism is about. Something good for us to think about. And you know, I've heard some good reports. One of our members today is being baptized down at Siskiyou. Praise the Lord. Who? I, I, my lips are sealed. I'll let them share that with you. And two others I have heard have accepted the Lord and have chosen to be baptized. Can we say praise the Lord? That's what we've been praying for. God, move upon the hearts of our young people. And so I know that this baptismal is going to be opened up soon. And if you want to join them, if you've never been baptized, I want to just encourage you to take that step of faith. To make that declaration. To trust Jesus Christ with your soul. To trust that he is able to save to the uttermost. That as much as God has delivered and did deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them through the Red Sea and brought them into the promised land, God will and can do that for you. Worship team, would you come and we will close. together.
thank you. We thank you that you are the God who saves and who washes us from every sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you separated us from our sins. Lord, we thank you today that you are the God who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and fire, as your word says. Lord, thank you for the gift of your, of your Holy Spirit that communes with us, reveals to us, speaks to us, lives in us, lives through us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the richness of this, this ordinance that you have given the church, baptism. Lord, and today I pray that even as you have done for thousands of years, Lord, that in this moment that you would do what only you can do, and that is draw hearts to the foot of the cross. Draw hearts to the person of your Son in whom all of your fullness and glory is expressed. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name.